According to Johns Hopkins University, the global number of coronavirus infections has reached 224 million, while the number of deaths has surpassed 4.6 million. Now, Johns Hopkins University has been keeping count of the daily cases and informing the world with critical data throughout the entire pandemic. And a year and a half since the global health crisis was declared, we speak to Dr. Stuart Ray, Professor of Medicine at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, on the recent surge of new variants and what we can make of the numbers and graphs. Very warm welcome to you, sir. Thank you so much for joining us today. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you. And well, these days, uh, Professor uh, Ray, we're hearing a lot about the Mu variant, and it has indeed been listed as one of the five variants of interest by the World Health Organization. And this comes as a concern for many, as um, there seem to be similarities uh, between the Mu variant and the dominant Delta variant. How worried should we be? Well, I think this is a sign that uh, new variants can come from any corner of the world and it's a sign that unchecked spread has occurred because these ar arising of these new variants is almost certainly due to a, an un infrequent event uh, where the virus rapidly changes and gains a new function, uh, putting us all at risk. Uh, this one uh, arose in South America, most likely. That's where the earliest strains of this uh, variant appear to have arisen. Uh, so we can expect these new variants to arise and we have to keep an eye on them to see whether they would truly put us at risk globally. Um, well, for now, it seems the Delta variant is dominating cases around the world. 99% uh, of the cases in your country and uh, most of the cases in, here in South Korea as well. But do you think the, this, this variant is going to stay dominant um, throughout the foreseeable future, throughout the autumn and the winter? Well, I think there are a couple of considerations here. One is is this uh, mu variant going to be able to outcompete Delta? And so far, we have not seen the two in a head-to-head -head race. Uh, the mu variant has what I, you might compare to a, a car parked by the side of the road with very nice racing uh, tires and a big engine and racing stripes. And we think that might be a fast car, but until we see it on the racetrack with the fastest car to date, we won't know. Uh, I think we should also appreciate that Delta is now a very diverse lineage of viruses. So we name these based on their their parentage, their ancestry. Uh, but Delta is now a very diverse set of viruses, many of which have different features from others. Uh, so we also have to realize that Delta is changing constantly. And that's one of the ways in which it's dominating. Well, that's, that was a recent UK study that showed um the effects of Pfizer and AstraZeneca vaccines tend to wane significantly within uh, 90 days. Um, are you then expecting infection cases around the world to rise as the effects of vaccines start to decline? Much of those data are based on laboratory testing of serum from people uh, or plasma. Uh, and so it's an indirect test of the danger of these variants uh, and the waning of immunity. In fact, our immune systems have many layers uh, antibodies being one of them. And so far, the vaccines are doing a very good job of preventing uh, hospitalization and death. Uh, they also reduce case counts, so they reduce the frequency with which people get infected, and they reduce how long they're infectious. So even with the waning measurement of immunity with antibodies, in fact, we still have a lot of activity from these vaccines, and we can depend on them to protect us We'll continue to learn about whether we need booster shots, but the need in the general population for those is still unclear. Oh, well, there's right now there's um, a growing amount of concern because of all the uh, variants that are uh, seeming to pop out of nowhere. And while well, researchers are now tracking a new uh, coronavirus variant that was recently identified in South Africa, and it seems mm -hmm. to have a startling number of mutations, and it's called the C12 variant. Well, why is it causing such interest? Well, it has uh, been seen in many of the districts in South Africa and has also been seen uh, in Asia and Europe. And so there is some concern about uh, whether this variant could spread more widely. It has not dominated the epidemic uh, in competition with Delta, but it is highly mutated. Uh, now, we say highly mutated, but it has about 50 changes in the whole genome with a genome that has a length of 30,000. So still there's, uh, you know, one in a thousand or two in a thousand of the, all the nucleotides in the genome have changed. So it's still pretty similar, and our T cells can still recognize both of these quite well. But we need to watch for these uh, highly mutated versions because they might gain a new skill 
uh, that will cause us trouble. Right, and um, you said that the C12 variant is highly mutated, and it said that the rate of evolution is about 1.7 times as um, faster than the current global rate for the um, coronavirus variants in general. What does it mean for a variant to be highly mutated and also have a high rate of evolution? Well, I think it's uh, an important question because I don't think we have evidence that it's currently evolving at that very high, high rate, but at some point in its lineage, it jumped into the fast lane like an express lane on an auto road and has uh, traveled quickly for a while. One of the ways to think about this is if an animal in a given uh, ecological environment learns to live in a new niche, uh, you know, if it's in a tide pool and it goes into a drier or wetter location, it will need to change to adapt to that new niche to make best use of it. So we can think of these rapidly evolving uh, variants as ones that must have gained some new function which required them to evolve quickly. Uh, I don't think it's likely that these will continue to evolve quickly, uh, but it is a sign of some gained function at some point in its past. Well, since the early days of the pandemic, most of the world has been relying on Johns Hopkins University's data on the spread of the outbreak. I mean, how is your institution able to respond and um, develop, it, develop this tracking system so quickly? I mean, faster than most governments. Well, I think it's good to be humble about this. We were dependent on everybody in the world contributing data. And one of the great lessons of this pandemic has been the value of globally shared data. Lauren Gardner, my colleague in civil engineering and one of her students uh, in late January thought we should have a dashboard. And so in 48 hours, they put up this uh, data source uh, linked website and they made it clear to everyone that the more data they were fed, the more they could display. And it's a wonderful illustration of humans working together across the world, uh, dealing with a pandemic that reminds us how small the world can be. Oh, well, what have been some challenges or difficulties that most people might not know about in gathering all this data and really operating this very global system? Well, you know, it's, it's hard to get everyone using the same tools at the same time. So sharing the sequence out of China was a key step. If that had not happened early, we would not have been ready. Uh, you know, Pfizer and Moderna very quickly uh, designed vaccines, as did other companies. And that was possible because of this data sharing. It has been challenging to get health data shared globally for a variety of reasons, uh, in part uh, due to health privacy concerns, which are quite valid. Uh, and so it has sometimes been hard to track in a consistent way across the globe. It's also been a learning experience for all of us, how best to test for the virus, how best to test for antibodies. I think we now have very good assays, uh, but we had some confusion early on that I think undermined people's understanding and that's made it hard to standardize the assays we use to detect infection and detect past infection. Uh, going forward, we need assays to tell us whether or not people are truly immune, and that's a growing body of knowledge, but not settled yet. And while analyzing all this data um, and this um, inflow of information, how do scientists discover new variants or new trends in the uh, pandemic? Well, fortunately, uh, there was a group of people working on influenza who had already developed infrastructure to share protocols. And so uh, the Arctic network uh, very quickly developed uh, protocols for amplifying the whole genome of the virus and then sharing that data quickly through the GISAID network. Uh, and NextStrain was another uh, group that had tools for visualization. All of these things knitted together and other efforts really made a big difference because it enabled us to get the whole genome of the sequence within just a day or two of having a positive specimen. What that's meant is that uh, we sequence the whole genome and then the tools that I just mentioned allow us to cluster the sequences, look at the evolutionary paths and identify new lineages that are growing at an unexpected rate. All of this requires a great deal of epidemiology and mathematics and a lot of wonderful quantitative skills that fortunately had been built up prior to this epidemic beginning. Well, until now, there's been quite a lot of focus on vaccination as the main means of building mass immunity against the variant. But um, with the ongoing surge of the Delta variant, I mean, it's quite clear that this hasn't exactly been a foolproof plan. What kind of database technologies or solutions can actually help us um, beat this virus? Well, I think increasingly local granular analysis of vaccination rates and uh, other testing 
and uh, case rates and hospitalizations and complications, and also the long symptoms, uh, tracking those to understand the full, full impact of this epidemic helps. What we're seeing is that even though the vaccines are not perfect, they still provide substantial protection against infection and complications. And as we get more and more granular data, we can see that and begin to help people manage their risk. Uh, so we're not going to eliminate this virus from the world, uh, but I think we can look toward a future when rates are lower and we can use local data and dynamic reporting to recognize when risks are higher and we need to wear masks more and when risks are lower and we don't, uh, who's more at risk and who needs more uh, immunity through vaccination and other tools. So we're learning all the time, but I think this will be a manageable future. We just need uh, the data to be uh, kept up uh, and o open for everybody to use. Well, as you said, so many believe that coronavirus, um, the COVID-19 virus isn't going to go away completely and that there might actually be more uh, frequent outbreaks of viral disease in the future. What are your thoughts on this? Well, I think that, you know, for this virus, we're likely to have outbreaks. Uh, we're a very global community now and we have variation in the way that people use risk mitigation. It would help to have increasingly shared understanding of ways to reduce risk. But I think as humans encroach on animal territory uh, and when we have frequent contact with animals in a way that it puts us at risk for transmission, we are likely to continue seeing outbreaks of, you know, viruses like these coronaviruses, the Nipah virus, the Lisa virus. You know, there are a lot of viruses uh, out there, many of which we might not even know the names of yet. Uh, and we need to be careful about how we uh, interact with wild animals and consume them and uh, respect those boundaries uh, to the extent that we can and protect ourselves when we can't. Um, was there anything about the coronavirus that really surprised you um, throughout this course of the pandemic, something that you didn't expect um, in the early days of the epidemic? Well, I think that based on the experience with SARS, COV from 2002, 2003, we thought that symptoms could be a useful indicator for risk. And I think we've learned that the hallmark of this virus has been its ability to spread in people who don't have significant symptoms. And so that's made it very hard to use symptom-based or you know thermometer-based uh, tracking of risk. And uh, that has surprised us. I think we've also been surprised uh, by the uh, degree to which uh, transmission uh, risk could increase. So the Delta variant is so much more transmissible uh, that changed the rules for us. Earlier this year, we thought that maybe we would not need as many precautions and the infectiousness of Delta has changed that calculus. Uh, has not changed our tools, but has changed the, the risk equation so that we have to work harder to control uh, the same virus. Well, throughout this pandemic, we've seen a very um, rapid development of uh, COVID-19 vaccines, therapeutics, and even digital tools to help us um, flatten the curve. What kind of new breakthrough technologies are you looking forward to in the future based on this experience? Well, you know, it's funny because we worked at best at both ends of the spectrum. So pretty early, we found that in the sickest patients, corticosteroids like dexamethasone could be quite helpful for people who, in extremis. We learned about the management of oxygen delivery in those sickest patients. Uh, so we were able to reduce death for those uh, most complicated patients pretty early, uh, you know, a year ago. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we've not developed great antiviral drugs. We have some moderately good ones. Uh, but not great ones. And then the monoclonal antibodies uh, that have been developed are very useful for keeping people uh, out of the hospital. But once they're sick, they don't work as well. The problem is delivering those is difficult. Uh, vaccine development was a big surprise how rapid that came through. Uh, and that's working very far upstream. But the part in the middle, uh, treating people who are moderately sick, remains a gap. And we need uh, means to treat uh, the moderate sickness and also to manage risk for the people with the worst uh, immunocompromise due to pre-existing medical conditions. That's still a challenge. And of course, a, a huge population is children and we're not doing enough to protect children. We need vaccines that are effective and safe for those. Uh, and we're working on that. Dr. Stuart Ray, Professor of Medicine at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Thank you for your time today. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be with you. And to our viewers, as always, thank you very much for watching.